This is a lecture for my sixth hour class on the 8th of March. What'd y'all say? 75. I said, uh, no, no, I said 80. They don't, yeah. they don't bail pay anymore. They do round bails now. Yeah, I said 200. So if you, in the old days when I used to haul hay, if you got down by the fence row where it maintained, well, you might get a 75 pound bail, usually about 60 pounds. Bale of cotton weighs 500 pounds. Okay. Yeah, what did you say? I said 200. 200? Well, you know, close. <laughs> they would, they, by the way, how much could a good hand pick in a day? 80 pounds. 900 pounds. A good, hand, a good hand could pick 300 pounds a day. I trip 300 pounds a day. I do so, that in half. Anyway, days. anyway. Light work. Do we still grow a lot of cotton these days? Or have we uh, not as much. You, most cotton you get from India and uh, Egypt. Okay. Most, but but in, in, in the further south you go, you have Louisiana, Mississippi, out there, they still, they grow. This whole area, this whole, they didn't, listen, in the 30s, they didn't grow anything else here except cotton. Not a thing. Uh, but uh, is it anyway. still as profitable huh? like Egypt? Yes. Still as profitable. Yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't profitable, guess what? Yeah, it's not growing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly true. Anyway, look. Uh, so the uh, New England, or, or excuse me, the uh, American Colonization Society. Their idea was we'll buy the slaves from their masters, and we will resettle them in uh, Africa. Okay. There's my uh, God. Yeah. Well, anyway. Uh, I ought to have a map here, and I don't, as usual. Anyway, the on the way. Well, here we go. They, you know, and, and students often say, "Well, they said, yeah, we'll buy these slaves and send them back to Africa." They weren't going back. They they were Americans. They were born here. They had been here. Their ancestors had been here for four hundred years, many of them. But here's the United States, and they said, "We'll purchase that." This was called the Gold Coast. This right here is where the slave trade took place. It's estimated that 30 million Africans were sold on that coast to the rest of the world, not just the United States. And by the way, most slaves that were ever brought to the New World were sold uh, in the uh, uh, Latin America, okay, Latin America. But the Gold Coast, and they actually, this society raised enough money, as you point out, to buy a small country right there called Liberia. Liberia is uh, Latin for liberty. Uh, and they named the capital city of that country after the, uh, the president at the time. And the president at the time was James Monroe. So the capital city of Liberia is Monrovia, okay? And it's interesting. You know, uh, African Americans here uh, maybe trace their ancestry and they might, you know, you might do the swab and they might say, well, uh, you know, you, your family came from uh, the uh, Sudan, or your family came from Zaire, or your family came from Tanzania, your earliest ancestors, okay? It's interesting that if you go to uh, Liberia and you do swap them, and uh, they do their uh, ancestry, they'll tell you, yeah, you know, my ancestors came from Tennessee. My ancestors came from Virginia because they were Americans. And by the way, this is one of the biggest flops in history. And, and, and I want you to get this down about the American Colonization Society. A lot of people say, well, they just wanted to free the poor slaves. That wasn't it at all. Uh, it, was, it was pretty racist. Their idea is we've got to get black people out of this country because blacks and whites can never live peacefully together. That's the motivating factor. You're with me? That's the motivating factor behind it. They'll never live peacefully together. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is a pretty big plot. They only managed to purchase 10,000 slaves and ship them to Africa. Again, not back to Africa. I want you to get that. These are Americans being purchased. Uh, I guess in Africa they were at least they were at least free. Okay, but they only freed quote about 10,000, and they didn't free them. Again, I will just emphasize because they had any sympathy for the way that African Americans were uh, treated. Slaves, get this down, were considered to be property. Uh, and of course, there are different types of property. They were chattel. Don't write slaves were cattle. That's not what I said. Chattel. Chattel property is personal property. Somebody says, collect your chattels and get out of here. That means to collect everything you own and leave. It's personal property. This is my personal property. I've had that since the first day I taught. 
That's mine. Doesn't belong to anybody else but me. Although I stole it from the super school that I taught at when I left, it was on the chalkboard and I just grabbed it. I don't think they ever missed it. But anyway, it's chattel property. It's mine. That watch I just showed you is chattel, chattel property. Chattel property, by the way, uh, and get this down, slaves are considered to be property by uh, both the Constitution of the United States and Southern state constitutions, just like a house or a horse or a pair of boots. But it's interesting. One of the great paradoxes of slavery, write that word down. One of the great paradoxes of slavery. In other words, something, a paradox is something that seems impossible, but it's actually true. So, you know, how can so slaves were considered by the law to be property, but at the same time, the very law that allowed them to be bought and sold like that, a chair, at the same time, uh, they were considered to be humans. Write that down. They were considered to be humans. In 1821, a master in Mississippi was hanged. A white master was hanged. And by the way, he was found guilty by an all-white jury and a white judge. He was hanged because he was working with one of his slaves, and the slaves did something to irritate him, and he picked up a board, maybe something like a tube before, and he hit that slave and killed him. And he thought, well, I'll walk. That's just my property. But the judge, the judge who sentenced him said, while he may be property, the law recognizes him as human. And the man was hanged, okay? Hanged. There was a master who castrated the slave, and he was sent to prison for five years. So for, like, beatings, they... They could take it to trial for like assault. Mm -mm. Not for no, so. no, no. Uh, uh, again, as you're going to see, I'm going to get to this. It depends on who you were, where, not who you were. It depends on where you were. Okay, where you were. A lot of people did a lot of horrible things to slaves, and they were never. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. Uh, but these are just examples of the of, of southern courts. Uh, at the same time, they say that's your property. They say that is also a human being. Uh, and as I say, the treatment of the slaves largely depended on the master uh, of the slave and where they were. On Jefferson Davis's plantation, he had a plantation called Briarfield. Uh, there was never, he had a thousand slaves. He was one of the five men in the South that owned a thousand slaves. And no slave was ever whipped at Briarfield. And by the way, if a slave committed an offense, Jefferson Davis left, had slave juries a jury of 12 black slaves would decide the punishment for anyone who broke the rules. And also Jefferson Davis brought in doctors and dentists to regularly care for the slaves. He even had a day nursery uh, for mothers who had to work in the fields. Uh, this, now listen to me, this, so, 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 you know, there's this old saw around that, well, slaves didn't have that bad. Uh, slaves didn't, no, this was the exception. This was not, not the rule. Uh, there were various methods, get this down, of disciplining slaves. So now let's look at what usually happened. One was to tie a muzzle. You know what a muzzle is on a dog? To tie a muzzle around them for a week when they couldn't eat or drink. Deny them food. Slaves were forced to wear iron collars. Slaves were branded like cattle. Slaves were burned alive. Slaves were castrated. Slaves were sealed up in a small metal box. I'm talking about a box that they would open the top of it and they had holes punched in the top of it. That was your only uh, source of air. Uh, and they literally had to shove you down in it. It wasn't like something you sat in and they shut the door. They had to cram you in there and then they would force that down on your head, you're, you're crunched up like that, and uh, they fastened it with leather straps and then just tossed you out of the sun. I mean, just some day in July, come out here and just sit in this parking lot on that pavement for about, oh, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours and see the effect that that has on you, much less sitting uh, in, a, in a metal box. They had men called slave breakers. If you had a slave that resisted you, and we're going to get to this in a minute, slaves resisted slavery. Slaves didn't take this lying down. They resisted slavery. Matt Turner being an example, maybe the most famous example. But they had men who advertised themselves as slave breakers. Uh, and you would take them to their plantation, and in three or four months, and it cost you a lot of money, but in three or four months, when you, could, when you went to pick your slaves up, they were very docile and 
uh, would do what you said because they were beaten and whipped on a daily basis. Slave plantations had slave dogs, these big mastiffs with massive jaws. You know, the Romans, ancient Romans bred, you know what a bull mastiff is? The ancient Romans bred those, and I used to know how many fat thousands of pounds of pressure they could put down once they latched onto you. They could put the, on your uh, hand or your foot, you know, and uh, slaves, there are all sorts, in the records of these plantations, there are all sorts of uh, records of slaves having a foot chewed off or a hand uh, or a leg literally chewed off. Women tackled by these huge dogs, women trying to run away and their breasts chewed off. Babies being snatched out of their mother's arm. You know, if you're carrying something, uh, hopefully you've got a playful dog, but if you know, I come in with my briefcase and my dog's trying to take it away from me, but you, but you know, if you're carrying something, the dog will ignore you and go to that. Uh, and they literally would crush the skulls of these babies, their mothers fleeing maybe for freedom. But the main way of disciplining slaves, get this down, was whipping. Whipping. And whipping, listen to what I'm going to say. Whipping was usually the last resort. Why is that true? I mean, you whip a slave when all else is failed. Why is that true? Why was it the last resort? You could kill them. Well, you could kill them. And it, it, they it, couldn't it, bend over to get the gun. Huh? They couldn't bend over to You could damage them. You know, no, let me tell you something. Somebody that knows what they're doing with a whip, uh, they can hit you uh, five or ten times. I don't know the movies they have. Oh, give him 500 lashes. Well, you know, he's dead if you do that. But they, they can whip you to where you can't raise your arms. Over, you know, and, and so if I pay $2,000 for a slave and he can't work, what good is that to me? Remember John McCain, the Republican that ran for president? He was in Vietnam. He was in prison and they came in and people with bamboo sticks. And every day they had him strip his clothes off and they whipped him. And when he ran for president many years later in the, 19, in, in the 2000s, he ran against Obama in 2008. With the crowd, you know, politicians with the crowd cheers, they wave like this, he waved like that because he couldn't raise his arms any higher than that. So the reason, it's not out of, again, it's not out of any particular sympathy for slaves. They're not thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't whip people. Maybe that's immoral. They don't want to destroy their property. And, of course, it's a very cruel thing that we have to talk about when we talk about slavery and the leading up to the Civil War. It's a very... Uh, cruel thing to talk about human beings being property, but that's the way they were viewed in the South by the slave owners. Usually a last resort. Because slaves were, you know, you paid anywhere from $250 to five, and there's a special breed of slave that I'm going to talk about in a minute, and they cost you $5,000 each. Five, that was that was approaching, I would say, an $1,855,000 slave. That's approaching, I would say, a quarter of a million dollars that you paid for those slaves. And they're very, quote, special slaves. Well, wouldn't that be like, are you talking about like the light-skinned girls? The what? The girls. The, yeah, the yeah, yeah. They, they, probably, probably, they call them fancy girls. Yeah, they probably wouldn't whip them. Up. No. Okay, so they not have to work. No. Yeah. If, if, if for no other reason, for the money alone. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk all about that in just a minute. Uh, but anyway. To five thousand dollars, and whipping could uh, uh, permanently damage these uh, slaves. Uh, and the purpose of the slave, listen, the purpose of the slave was to work. If a slave couldn't work, but you know, one of the drawbacks of slavery is that slaves got old and they couldn't work anymore. Uh, now, and so on, on these plantations, one of the problems with Southerners by the time of the Civil War scratching their heads saying, well, gee, is this really economically feasible to have slaves? Because you still had to, I used to ask students, what do you think they did when a slave got too old to work? And they'd say, oh, kill them. No, they didn't do that. They just stayed there on the plantation. And you had to take care of them, and you had to feed them, and you had to provide them. Uh, now, in South America and Latin America, where most slaves that ever came to this hemisphere went, when you got too old, what did they do to you? They took you out and tied you to a tree in the jungle, and the animals came and ate you. Okay. Uh, the American system, as horrible as it was, and I can't emphasize that enough, the American system, as horrible as it was, was the most humane slave system. You know what they used to threaten to do to slaves that resisted them? They would tell you, I'm going to sell you south. What were they talking about? I'm going to sell you to Cuba. And you're going to go out there in those tobacco fields and sugar cane fields, and you're going to work. How long did a slave last once they got to Cuba? Six months. Huh? On average, three months. And listen, we're talking about young people at the prime of health. They literally worked them to death. 
You know, to be soul south was a, was a death sentence, okay? What happened to the survivors of Nat Turner's Rebellion? They got, they got soul south. Not all of them. Some of them got soul south. Well, they got killed, yeah. They worked them to death. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, look, I want you to write down the plantation power structure. Who ran these plantations? Well, first you've got at the top of the pile, the top of the pyramid, you've got the master. And then you've got a white man usually, but sometimes it was a slave. Or sometimes it was a free black man. And he was called the overseer. So you've got the master and you've got the overseer. Okay. And the overseer would confer with the master. And the master would say, you know, this week I want those 40 acres out there plowed. And so the overseer would go to the man who actually directed the slaves in their work in the fields. And this man was a black man usually. And he was called the driver. The driver. Speaking of whipping, when there was a whipping to take place, the master usually didn't do it. Ooh. <clears throat> the overseer usually didn't do it. Who did most of the whippings on the plantation? The driver, who was a black man. Isn't it interesting? Most of the slaves didn't like the driver, right? They felt like he was kind of like going against Of course them. they didn't like him. Well, no, not good. He's he's good. Him. He just like hit me like, 20 times today. He's a pretty neat guy. No, they hate him. Well, they felt like he kind of like switched to like. Sure. Yeah, but but listen, but now you, I, your point is well taken. But who ran the death camps for the Germans? Jews, Jews. It's a matter. You know what the strongest human instinct is? Self preservation. We all want to live. If you had been in one of those camps, and they just said, you know what we want you to do after we gas them, we want you to pull the dead bodies out, and by the way, rip open their belly and see if there are any diamonds in there. And then we want you to put them on these carts and we want you to take them back and feed them into those ovens one at a time. And you'll live. Would you very right? specific Would you have said, are you insane? I'm a Jew. You think I'm going to do this to my people? Is that what, is that what you would have said? No. Yeah, if you were in a Hollywood movie and had a script. Yeah. yeah. The Jews ran the concert. Who ran these plantations? Slaves. Well, some slaves. The driver that everybody loved. Yeah. No, nobody loved them. Yeah. These guys, let me tell you something, these drivers... They're the ones who usually did the whipping. And by the way, they're some of the most powerful people on the plantation. They get better housing. They get better food. If a, a slaves wanted to marry, they had to get the permission, not of the master. They had to go to the driver. And by the way, he could punish you. And he could withhold your food. You could come for your food ration at the end of the day and he'd say, what are you doing here? So were they a lot of like murders of the driver? Huh? Like, a lot of people like killed the driver? Like, I don't know if a lot of drivers get killed. <laughs> They may have. They give the driver. They should. Have. <laughs> they give the driver a gun. Uh, they might have. They might have. Maybe. He gave you your clothing. He assigned you the cabin. Self-preservation. Self. And I know we're all self-righteous and say, "Well, if it had been me, I would have been saying, well, I can't do this to my fellow black people.' Are you crazy? No, we've done it in most instances. Self-preservation." Usually about 20 lashes was it, and that ran the risk of disabled. You know, five or 10, but 20 at the most. And it was done in front of the other slaves. Whipping was used as a deterrent. All this said, only four slaves. Get this statistic down if you want to know about what slavery was like. Four slaves in every 100 lived to be 60. And by the way, you know, let, me, let me quantify that. What was the lifespan for whites and blacks in 1850? So if you were a male born in Alabama, any color, how long could you expect to live? 65. Uh, 50. And you were usually dead in your 40s. There's a big high death rate. But anyway, only four slaves and every 100 lived to be 60. But that's before like all the medicine and everything. Like that's when they were still like. Well, that's why you're living as long. If they had, you know, if they just had antibiotics. Then, Lifespan would have increased astronomically, okay? But remember this. It was not the whip or slave dogs that enabled 5 million white Southerners to control 4 million slaves. What was it? Oh, the ignorance. What? No. Paternalism. Well, paternalism, right? You keep people ignorant. Not stupid. I'm not talking about you know. Well, let me... Let me... Uh, Oh, my credit. Let me uh, <laughs> correct my error here. It was paternalism, but a big part of paternalism was ignorance. Is that okay? 
I have credit. It's a better yeah, I want have credit. <laughs> Anyway, back to what I was saying. Paternalism. You keep people ignorant. You don't teach them skills. You don't teach them to read and write. You provide them with what they need. And you can control them. Because you have completed a dependency. Your, your parents, your, your parents here, and I say this about all parents, the ones that are teaching you to be independent, they're just giving you a little bit more and more independence. They're doing you the greatest favor they'll ever do. The ones that hug you and just can't let you go, oh, don't leave, oh, don't leave, basically slavery. They're going to wake up when they're 40 and go down to the to the uh, couch to watch some midnight television to hit something on it and say, is that that remote that I'm? And they're going to turn on the light. It's going to be you living at home at 40 <laughs> years old. That's right, because you don't know how to operate in the real world. You, oh, you're not cool. independent. Mama has done it all for you. And the parents that make, you know, the greatest thing my parents ever did to me is they said, my dad, when I was a little boy, used to occasionally get out and give us a little philosophy, and he would always say things like, well, when you're 18 and on your own, I mean, it was just a given. When I was 18, I was leaving, you know. Best thing that ever happened to me. But anyway, um, that's paternalism. Provide them everything they need, and, and it makes it very difficult. I know in the movies, you know, I know in the movies, they say, well, let's run away. They run away, and two weeks later, they're the president of the Chase Manhattan Bank. That didn't work that way. You know, if you run away, how do we support ourselves? What is next? And it's all related back to this system of paternalism. Well, of course, perhaps the most brutal aspect of slavery was the slave auction. Get this down, the slave auction. Uh, it destroyed the African-American family. You know, a slave baby, when it was born, as soon as it exited the birth canal, it was worth a hundred bucks when it drew its first breath. And a lot of times, as soon as the baby was born, they took it from the mother and sold it. <clears throat> Slaves were sold beside furniture and cotton and cattle and horses. Um, babies and children were torn out of their mother's arms. Husbands and wives were separated forever. Women slaves, uh, in particular, they were greased so they would shine. Literally, their bodies would shine. And when a prospective buyer came up, I think maybe here's some bill of sales. Engineer Marlowe, age 12, house servant 19, Hercules. These are, that's, you know, you go to the slave, what's for sale? They hand you that when you walk in. Field hands, gardener, misspelled gardener, maid and seamstress, 25 years old field hand, and so forth, okay? That's a bill of sale. There's another one. You know, this Martha, two. Julia, eight. Frank, one, okay? Families literally being torn apart. Mothers having their babies stripped out of their arms, never to see them again, but they would take these women back, and they were in the nude. I mean, I'm not trying to be crude here, and they would poke, and they would prod them, and inspect, they quote, inspect them um, before uh, purchasing, purchasing them. It was just one of the most degrading things. There's an artist drawing of a slave auction, okay? And there's an actual picture in a hotel. That was a hotel in St. Louis. I'm sure it looks in pretty ragged condition, no longer exists. But right there in the lobby of the hotel where people were checking in, just got off the stagecoach and checking in, that was a stage. They should have preserved that. I hope somehow they figured the way to cut that out and put it in a museum because human beings were sold right there in the lobby of the hotel. And uh, that was in uh, St. Louis. You know, John Randolph, I showed you a picture of him, the little guy, the smooth face. He looked like a 12-year-old. He was considered to be one of the greatest orators in the history of this country. And when he was an old man, a young newspaper reporter went out to talk to him. Because he, John Randolph was known for his oratory. It would be as if somebody today wanted to interview great, uh, in a, a great uh, professional football quarterbacks, you know. I mean, it wouldn't seem odd to us at all if they went to a Tom Brady and sat down and said, you know, what's the secret? Why are you so great? What did you do? How did you get to where you are? And so they were asking um, um, John Randolph of Virginia, old Roanoke, Virginia, and he was a slave owner, they were asking him, how did you get to be such a great speaker and that sort of thing? And finally, the reporter asked him, who's the greatest speaker you ever heard, Mr. Randolph? And without a moment's hesitation, John Randolph said, 
a mother. She was on an auction block and they had just sold her baby. End quote. In other words, the greatest and the most passionate speech I ever heard was from a woman who was pleading for her baby back that had just been sold out of her arms. John Randolph. The life of slaves was absolutely horrible. Whatever else you can say about it, it was horrible. I like this one down, Margaret. And by the way, there are some slaves. I know people talk. There, there are some real slaves. Okay. The woman is ironing. There are some slaves actually at work in the field. There are some slave quarters. There's a slave child standing out there. But, you know, I've shown you the big plantation houses. Well, that's where the slaves lived. There's a man. I don't know who he was. I don't know where he was. But I can tell you one thing about him. He resisted slavery. They whipped him again and again and again. And he fought slavery. Okay, you can tell that by the whelps on his back. There's a slave family, a little bit different from those plants. They produced the wealth that built those plantation houses, but that's what they lived in. Whoops. No. Try here. <clears throat> Write her down, Margaret Garner. <laughs> that's her, Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner was 23 years old. She was biracial. In the 19th century, a biracial person, they, this was the term they used, a mulatto, biracial. She was the daughter of her white plantation owner. By the way, her father slash owner was a former member of the United States Congress. And she ran away to, with her children to escape the cruelty of slavery. And she was cornered by the slave catchers with her four children. And when they burst into the cabin where she was hiding, she had a butcher knife and she killed, she killed her own daughter rather than see her return to slavery. And she had turned to start killing the other three and she was stopped by the slave catcher because she was going to destroy this valuable property. So she stopped by the slave catcher and the catchers, excuse me, they were all transported back to the plantation and in being transported back to their plantation i think they were in mississippi in being transported back they had to put them on a steamboat for part of the journey and uh, uh the steamboat had collided with another steamboat and margaret garner was standing there holding her infant daughter and was thrown overboard with the infant daughter and people dived in to try and save her but before they could save her she drowned that daughter she thought you're better off. Now that's how horrible slavery is. What does it take for a mother to kill their child? All these stories about, well, slavery wasn't that bad. Well, look at that. What does it take for a mother to kill her child? Uh, and uh, they think she drowned. I, I think she did too. She drowned that baby to keep the baby from going, growing up as a slave. And she herself died in Mississippi in 1858, just a couple of years before the war started. And her, she, she died of typhoid fever. Her dad was a congressman? Her dad, yes, her father, her, own, her owner was a plantation owner who had been a congressman. He didn't like take care of her. No, absolutely. I'm telling you, slavery's horrible. Look as hard as you can for the good aspects of slavery. <laughs> it ain't there. It doesn't, it's sorry, it doesn't exist. And I come from that generation, by the way. We were taught in high school, well, slavery wasn't that bad. Bad food, bad clothing, bad. It's okay. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Don't take my word for it. I'll give you several authors and books. In fact, well, anyway, here's one you can start with. <coughs> roll, Jordan, roll. It's by a historian named Eugene Genovese. That's, that, that'll, that'll start. And then go from there. That's a great book. And it's a sad, sad book, but it's a great book. Anyway, um, yeah, large story. And here's an artist's drawing of the slave. And there's her dead child on the floor. And the other's clinging to her. Uh, yeah, she killed her child rather than 
see it return to uh, to slavery. Okay, it's a miracle that the African American family in this country was not destroyed. Well, these plantations. By the way, the other day I gave you the division of labor, didn't I? Yeah. Well, there's one group I left out, pretty important. I mean, if you you know we were talking about how important blacksmiths were. Uh, I just see it in my notes here how I left it out, but also Coopers. Write this down. Coopers. What was a Cooper? Barrel me. Yep. By the way, that's, I think up in Silver Dollar City, they do a demonstration. It takes a long time. Uh, it's quite a skill to be able to make a barrel. Uh, and that was the chief form of storage for almost anything, from water to bread. Anyway, these plantations range from a few acres to thousands of acres from a single log cabin with the master and his family. By the way, some plantations were like this. You had a cabin, there was a porch on the front. This porch ran all the way through. This was called the dog trot. And there would be a little back porch. Uh, the white family would sleep over here and the slaves would sleep over here. Okay, so some plantations were that small. Some plantations were that small. Put the huge white houses that I've shown you. Uh, here in a few weeks, we're going to right there, Mount Vernon. That's the back porch of the place. That's a slave plantation, uh, Mount Vernon uh, in Virginia, one of the prettiest places. If you watch, I think Saturday I saw that I didn't watch it, but they were going to show Gone with the Wind, the, the plantation house there, Tara, Twelve Oaks. There were plantation houses like that, and they were huge, and they had 20 to 30 or 40 rooms, with white pillars, and hundreds of slaves. Plantation life, get this down, was integrated. You know, it's interesting that segregation didn't occur until after slavery ended and during the Reconstruction. They were integrated. Blacks and whites were in constant contact with one another. The slaves had to be marched to the fields and supervised. There were social events. The big social event in the South right was down with corn shuckings when the corn crop was in, in the fall. It's like homecoming. Uh, and blacks and whites would drink and they would all gather and shuck corn. Uh, shuck all the corn and sort in the bins and do out. They would have bar they have these plantations, they would have barbecues, they would drink and they would dance. And uh, even though every southern state had laws against miscegenation, and miscegenation is a black white sexual union, that was the dirty little secret of the South. And to get to your fancy girls, um, I just want to say this and then I'll let you go. Uh, just to get to your fancy girls. Um, you know, most white southern slave owners married a white woman and they had white children. But then they would go off to some exotic southern city like New Orleans uh, and uh, they would bring back a light skinned biracial girl, 12 or 14 or 15 or 16. And sometimes they would say to their wives, I bought this as a gift. For this girl as a gift for you. Uh, this is your maid now. Or, uh, you know, they would just give her some general assignment around the house. And the reason they had bought her was to uh, to uh, uh, generate uh, their sons when their sons they felt came of age to generate their sons first sexual experience, okay? Um, but a lot of these white masters, it's interesting, fell in love with these girls. Uh, and what they would eventually do is that they would, you know, here you have a plantation 20 miles outside of Charleston. Now you would put her up in a townhouse with slaves of her own, maybe, and servants in a very fine townhouse, and she would live there, and you would have children by her. You would have two families, one black and one white. I'm not saying every southerner did, every white plantation owner did that, but that was more common in the South uh, than, uh, than uh, most people uh, my, my thing. Proof of that is, is that one million of the four million slaves, over one million, a million and a half of the four million slaves had uh, white, white ancestors, okay? Um, let me look here just a minute. Yeah, let's... Uh, Have one more day. Um, well, 
We'll cancel the test for tomorrow. And we'll take it when you come back to spring break. Thank you. I was like, man, we only have three days left for now. Like, huh? I said, we only have like three days left for now. Well, I want to make it worth your while. <laughs>